Good morning, everyone. I'm Tara Rodriguez, Director of the Division of School and Program Improvement at the Kentucky Department of Education. I'm very glad to be with you this morning. And we also have uh, some other presenters here as well. I'm David Malanti, work uh, in the Division of School and Program Improvement. And I'm Brenda Considine. I'm the branch manager for Title I. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining this morning. I'm gonna go ahead and share my desktop and uh, we'll get started with our presentation for this morning. Um, if you have a uh, question during the call, if you can send an email to me and I'll uh, put my email address up here on the screen for you. Uh, go ahead and send an email to that address and we will uh, get, try to answer your question during the call, but if not, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Uh, and then the webinar will also be posted and re uh, recorded and posted on the Title I Documents and Resources page, usually within a day or two after the webinar. Um, you should have received a copy of the slides and a Q&A document that I will uh, talk with you later about during the, during the presentation. So just to recap from our April webinar, uh, last month we had some GMAP updates and reminders that Brenda provided. Uh, David uh, spoke about equitable services, and I talked about time and effort reporting and just a little brief reminder about inventory management. For our agenda today, uh, Brenda is going to again talk about uh, uh, the Title I application in GMAP, and David will uh, chime in on that as well. Um, we have some the questions that I mentioned, the Q&A document from the April webinar, and I'll be talking about that. And then uh, David and Brenda have some uh, information to share about upcoming training and technical assistance opportunities. So, uh, Brenda, do you want to go ahead and tell us about what's new in the world of GMAP? Sure, Tara, thanks. Um, most of you probably have noticed that the consolidated application is open. It opened last Monday, May 18th, and we do have a due date for all those sections to be completed in GMAP, and that's June 30th. Just remember that the budget allocation that's listed in GMAP is preliminary, and uh, we've had some questions about that, and, and always remember that it won't be finalized until the first part of October. It's possible that Congress could come back and adjust some of those appropriations during their budget discussions and could really reallocate based on those discussions. And um, so when you're planning your budget, just always kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Some updates um, when we're discussing the district set aside, um, there is instances that you will have to reserve those at the district level. Um, and you're required to reserve uh, certain areas of those, especially homelessness that needs to be reserved. Uh, please always refer to the district guidance. Uh, if you click on this PowerPoint, that is a live link and it will take you to the Title I webpage, and that is an excellent document. It gives you uh, acceptable uses on those district set-asides in situations where we would not allow set-asides to occur. So please make sure you refer to that document. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about district set-asides just because when we're looking at applications, those are areas that sometimes districts struggle with or they have a lot of questions about. So an area that we do get some questions is regarding foster care. Uh, remember that districts may use Title I funds to pay for those additional costs when you need to transport children that are in foster care to keep them in their schools of origin. But please remember you have to collaborate with your child welfare agency. It is left up to the district to develop and implement clear and written procedures for how that transportation will be provided and arranged and funded for the duration of that child's time in foster care. Also homeless, the district must set aside funds to provide services for homeless children. We get a lot of questions about that. 
in your description, you must state the services that need to be provided, and you have to describe the method that you use to calculate an appropriate amount of services. You need to notify your principals of all the schools in your district that funds are available for students who become homeless during the school year. Now, a lot of questions center around the appropriate amount of set aside so that you can successfully serve your homeless students and collaborate with your homeless liaison. Also make sure that your district liaison as well as your school staff, and that's including anyone who's going to be in part of the enrolling process for new students, that they understand the law's definition of homeless. This will help ensure that the students are identified uh, properly and that they are able to get those services quickly. There is no set formula for determining that set aside, but you can look at identifying homeless student needs and a funding accordingly. You can also obtain counts of homeless students and you can multiply by your per pupil allocations to kind of give you um, a preliminary uh, amount. You can reserve a specific percentage based on your district's poverty level or the total Title I Part A allocation, or you can take some historical expenditure data and use that to determine an appropriate amount. Another area in district set aside is English learners. The districts are able to provide supplemental services or materials for students that are attending Title I schools only. So you may not pay for any part of their core program with federal funds, as this would uh, violate your Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. But if supplemental services are provided, the narrative must provide a description of specific services or materials. And there are several requirements for serving ELs under Title I, Part A, which must be met. Always remember that whether you're reserving funds or not, you must note in the district set aside that you are meeting the following requirements and note any funding sources that are being used. So that needs to be included in your English learners narrative. So that was kind of a quick recap of district set asides. Um, always remember that your consultant is available for technical assistance and support you through this GMAP process. And you always have the help for current page, which is embedded in the main navigation window for you. And monitor your consolidated checklist after you get your application completed. The consultants were going to be providing feedback during this time, this approval process time, through the checklist. And it's always nice to check that frequently. And Taryn, that's about all I have. I know David wanted to talk a little bit about our upcoming um, training, maybe? Yeah, Brenda. Um, I think coordinators just need to be aware that we are going to offer some training on GMAP where we're going to um, walk through page by page um, and talk a little bit about helpful hints, some hang ups that um, districts experience sometimes, and just general navigation um, through the um, system itself. Um, so if you're not accustomed to using GMAP, it would be a, a good resource for you to uh, join that. We'll plan on recording that particular webinar so it can be posted and shared. Um, and Brenda, you sent out a, an invitation directly to coordinators. What was the date on that? I forgot right offhand. Uh, June 9th. June 9th is our, is our target date for that technical assistance training. OK, we are also going to be sending out um, invitations to join on just some new coordinator training. It's going to be very similar if you attended last year's training to that. Um, but if you are brand new in the role, um, I would recommend, um, highly recommend joining that as well. Um, it will kind of we'll walk you through the general, the basics of Title I Part A and talk a little bit about your job responsibilities and where you uh, need to be focusing work at certain times of the year. Um, so we'll kind of go through the sections of the law and 
and um, give you the basics on that. There will be plenty of time for some discussion and questions there as well. Um, we we will um, send that that out in a uh, Commissioner's Monday email, and uh, we'll ask you to register for one of the dates that we're offering. Um, we're just going to ask you to register so we don't get 200 people on one um, one session. That way we'll have time to address everybody's questions and have plenty of discussion. You are welcome to join if you were, you know, um, there for last year's training or if you just want to sit through, but I will say it's going to be very similar to what we did last year. So if you're comfortable working through um, your application and you're pretty comfortable with the sections of the law, um, that may be something that you don't need to join, but you're welcome to join either way. Tara, Brenda, anything else to add to that? I do not, but it sounds great. Thanks, David. And Brenda, Brenda, did you have anything else to add? I do not. I, I hope that everyone um, that does struggle with GMAP tunes in for our technical assistance because David is the GMAP guru and he is going to take us through the process. And um, I know learning GMAP is sometimes a little frustrating. So anytime you can get a little heads up on how to navigate that process, it's always helpful. Okay, um, so we did have a question that came in and um, I'm going to uh, share the question. Uh, I know you may need, because this it's asking for the definition of homeless, and that's a great question. Um, can you all, while I'm talking through some of these Q&As, go ahead and um, see if you can find that and maybe share with uh, everybody where they could uh, locate some different places where they could uh, find not only the definition of homeless, but some other information about it. And then maybe at some point, maybe towards the end of uh, my presentation that you all can follow up with that. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, okay. We'll work on it. All right, then we'll go ahead and get started on uh, some of the Q&As. Uh, and I'm going to share with you or try to share with you some different uh, resources and some screens. And I'm going to start with the Q&A document that was sent out here um, right before the webinar started. So um, I'm not going to read that whole thing with you, but there are some things that I just want to highlight and go over. Um, so the first question said, is there some guidance on using parent uh, engagement funds? And so, uh, and, and, let me just back up just a second to explain where these questions came from. During our last month's webinar, we had several questions that came in towards the end, and we didn't have a chance to uh, get those answers to you. And it actually took a, a bit longer to get the answers um, for your questions than I anticipated. So um, they're ready to share now, obviously. And so I just want to kind of go over those with you. So back to this question on parent and family engagement. Um, you can read the response here that the res some resources are provided and so on, but this is a, a question that we've gotten a lot, um, including during in that uh, survey that you've gotten some links to. Several districts have asked for ideas on parent family engagement and especially at the high school level. So I wanted to share um, a couple of things that districts have actually uh, uh, forwarded on to us. Um, we had a couple that were willing to uh, let us um, share some of their efforts with you. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about what they're doing. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to Miss Kendall from Harrison County, and she was kind enough to provide not only a lot of information about her district's parent and family engagement work this summer, but she also sent some pictures, and I'll see if I can maybe share a couple of those with you. Um, so, uh, uh, so first, her district is going to continue their outreach to families throughout this summer, and they're providing learning activities and materials that students and families can work on together at home. 
um, this they're providing learning kits that students and families can work on together. And those learning kits will be available to all elementary students in Harrison County. Uh, every other week, the families will be encouraged to stop by an elementary school and pick up an activity that they can work on together. So I have some um, different examples of, of some of the kinds of things that they're, they're working on. The kits will be available in the front foyer of each school. Um, they're uh, aligned to the, the schools and the district's needs, which have to do with reading and STEM. Um, so one thing that they did was to send flower seeds with a special message that is mailed in all students' report cards. Uh, they encourage families to plant the seeds, take pictures of the flowers, and post the photos on the school's social media site. They also gave students spiral notebooks with some instructions in the front on the kinds of things that students could write in their notebook. And they're also working with their 21st century staff to provide other learning opportunities for families that, that families and students could do at home together. Uh, things like kite making, birdhouse building, uh, designing a family crest, etc. And families are encouraged to take pictures and post those on their school's social media sites. And so there are some other activities that she shared. Uh, there's a, the notebook starter activity that I mentioned. Um, let me see if I can pull some things up here just to give you some visuals. Let's start with the, um, uh, this was, oops, changed position on me. Um, but this was, uh, the little, uh, message that went home with the, the, the report cards. And there are some seeds on the little, um, the little cutout here that they can plant. There was also something that went out in social media on that. And you can see the same, um, the same message about, about the planting of the seeds. And then they also uh, mentioned the notebook, the journaling and the writing assignment, uh, writing uh, prompts that they were uh, encouraged and, and informed about. And they put some motivational stickers on the front of the notebooks. Um, then I mentioned that there was they also sent several different types of activities that students and families could do at home. This one was a science one. Um, it had to do with making a constellation viewer. And you can see here the different constellations that they could try, and I'm, I'm guessing that they would make the viewer and then see if they could find these constellations outside. Um, then we got a family recipe for ice cream in a bag. Can see lots of kids might enjoy doing something like that. Um, we had, they shared one. Uh, this one was a compiled list of different kinds of um, uh, family activities that could be done inside. They had an activity about raised salt painting, which is a, looks like an art activity. I've not seen what that would look like, but I'd be very curious. And then here's the message that they put in about the notebook starters. This is the, the spiral notebooks that have, and it gives some uh, possible ideas for things that students could write in their notebooks and so on. So I really want to thank Ms. Kendall for sharing this with us. Um, we also had another district who shared as well. They wanted to remain anonymous, so I'm not going to say who it was, but um, let's see if I can find that one. Oh, here it is. Um, in this other district, the high school teachers, this one I wanted to share with you because it does have to do with um, middle school and high school. Um, in this district, during the COVID shutdown, the middle school provided stipends so that both counselors could host a Zoom room to discuss with parents and families how NTI would be conducted, as well as discussing managing stress and social emotional health for the coming months. The high school teachers wrote and decorated personal postcards to mail home to all the students, including in the mailing were resources for families about mental health options, flash drives with assignments so that the high school students without internet but with computers could complete their assignments and resources for domestic violence and suicide prevention. The Title I coordinator in the district reported that schools had a 96 to 97 percent return of their NTI work. So congratulations on that. And so one thing I wanted to point out, too, is that a few months ago we had in a webinar about um, the importance of evaluating and using kind of a continuous improvement cycle on your um, on your parent and family engagement work. And so I can see here that that these districts seem to be trying to uh, come up with ways to track participation and the effectiveness of their work. So keep that in mind as well, because uh, we want to make sure that we are um, 
kind of collecting some evidence to show that their um, parent family engagement strategies are working. So thank you again to those districts for sharing. I really appreciate it. And I also want to give a shout out to Elise Crisp, one of our Title I consultants, for reaching out to her districts for, for uh, to ask them to share. Um, and Gina Gonzalez also had a suggestion for another district that we'll continue to follow up with as well. If you have any parent and family engagement initiatives you're working on this summer or you're planning next year and you would like to share them, please reach out to your consultant or contact me. We can share during a webinar like I just did, or we could write a short piece for the newsletter about it. Um, it's also possible that if we started building a little collection of these ideas, we might be able to create a Google uh, Classroom and districts could share their own ideas. That's just a thought, but let me know if that's something you would find helpful and we could uh, try to get that started. So uh, hopefully you like that little uh, foray into the parent and family engagement work. And uh, now I'll go back to our uh, Q&A here and see if we can um, roll down through some of these other questions. So this one came in as well. Uh, in the last webinar, the presenter mentioned it's possible to log into GMAP in one window to view the help information and simultaneously open GMAP in another browser to work on the application. And this district said uh, that, for in, that it didn't seem to save the work. And so what I asked one of the consultants to make a short video. Um, we need to do a little bit more editing on that, and then I'd like the district to uh, review the video and test the instructions. And uh, if it works, if others still are having this uh, same question, we can share that with everybody or we can even post it. So um, that's still in progress. Next question that came in said, if you're over all federal programs, does your time and effort documentation need to be divided? And so the answer is yes, you would put uh, the time and effort for each of the programs on your personnel activity report. Next question had to do with the COVID and it said, are digital signatures allowable? And we had said yes, but this person had a follow-up question. Uh, could a Google form you be used in its place? And the answer to that is still yes. There's some information in here though that I want to highlight. Um, be sure to have safeguards in place to ensure the correct person is completing and signing the form. So for example, uh, some way that requires a password or keeping an email trail, et cetera. And it would be best to document the reason for using the digital uh, signature when the state of emergency ends and to the extent it's safe to do so, you'll need to immediately revert to obtaining the physical signatures on the PAR and semi-annual certifications. Um, next question. Okay, this one I want to spend a little bit of time on. This was a good question. Do we need to ma maintain additional documentation such as a detailed daily work journal of the time spent on the activities and duties for Title I. Does it need to be that specific? For example, if an employee is paid 80% with Title I and 20% with general funds and that employee does not have a consistent daily routine, is it acceptable to list 6.4 hours for Title I and 1.6 hours for general fund on the PAR as an example? Or is additional documentation required that shows the actual duties being conducted and the actual time frame? So here is the uh, here's the answer to that. The time would be documented on the PAR in the way you've indicated by logging the number of hours worked on each cost objective to account for all time worked. Both the PAR and semi-annual certifications need to be signed and dated by the employee and a supervisor who has direct knowledge of the employee's duties. That is an important piece of documentation and an internal control because you're attesting that this is accurate, this is what you worked, and your supervisor is also confirming that they know that you did and they're, they're confirming that you did work that time. As for documentation, if you look on the checklist that's posted, it tells you what uh, the, the types of documentation we're, we ask for. Uh, we want to see who is paid, the, the uh, names, a list of who's being paid partly or fully with Title I, and if they're using the substitute or the semi-annual certification, we would want to see that they have a set schedule and would want to see that. Um, uh, also, if you uh, try to... Um, review the um, staff job roles that are listed in open house because we sometimes refer to those as well uh, as one form of evidence for time and effort percentages. 
So just review those and make sure they're accurate. Um, and so here's the, the answer to the rest of the question. For employees paid in any part with Title I funds, keeping a daily work jo journal or log would not be required unless it's part of your written time and effort policy. And so there's more information on the policy in the next paragraph. If you're already in the habit of maintaining a calendar that shows your daily activities, that's a good source of supporting documentation. Up-to-date job descriptions are something that most districts have, and, and they're also a good source of, of evidence as well. So let's go to this part right here. This information comes from, uh, there's a, a link down at the bottom. It's called the Cost Allocation Guide for State and Local Governments. And it says that it's important to have internal controls in place. And we know that that's important, including a time and effort policy. So having a written policy is an important internal control. And so the, the uh, cost allocation guide lists some bulleted points here about what should, what should be in this policy. It should include procedures for both semi-annual and PAR reporting. Uh, people should be trained on the requirements. And at a minimum, it lists the, the things that should be in there. List the steps and requirements for completion of time and attendance reporting. Describe the approval cycle that's required. Describe the processing of personnel charges to federal awards. And include an internal review process that's used to ensure effective internal control over the award. So back to the question about would it be required to keep a daily log we, we don't require something that specific, but if your policy says that you will, uh, then and that's how you're going to verify and ensure that the time that's worked is the correct time and that it's it's justifiably allocated to Title I, then that's what you would have to do. And I'll also say that we will have more guidance and information on this moving forward, more about the policy. And there are some other ways, some other kinds of internal controls and checks that you could do. And we will uh, continue to research those and provide that at a later date as as some additional guidance. Okay, so I'm going to check to see if we have any other questions that have come in. And uh, David and Brenda, are you all ready to um, uh, answer the question about the homeless definition? Yeah. Um, so I think there are several places you could find the definition of a homeless um, student. One would be um, in the Title I Part A handbook. Uh, pages 45, page 45 is where that starts, and the definition is actually on page 46, which it says homeless children and youth are defined as individuals who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. That might include kids who are sharing housing with other people, living in motels, hotels, um, campgrounds, um, living in emergency or transitional transitional shelters or abandoned in hospitals. Um, it could include children and youth who have a nighttime residence that is in a public or private place not designed for um, regular sleeping accommodation. Um, children and youth who are living in cars, uh, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, so forth and migratory children or youth um, automatically qualify because they are living in circumstances, who qualify because they are living in circumstances described above. Um, so another place you might look is on the KDE webpage. You can find um, a homeless webpage dedicated uh, specifically for homeless children and youth. Um, that includes additional information such as applying for the competitive McKinney-Vento grant, um, which not every district um, receives. So there are several resources you can kind of check into for a definition of, of homeless children and youth. All right, thank you, David. Um, we have had a few other questions to come in. They, most of them seem like they're kind of an individual thing, and there are some other things we may need to uh, have some discussion on, but I think that this is pretty much it for the content of our webinar today. But if you did send us a question or a comment, we will be sure to follow up with you afterward, maybe hopefully today, maybe tomorrow, um, uh, but we will make sure to get back with you. Um, Brenda and David, do you all have anything else that we want to share? I guess just one more thing for me, 
I'm, I've been receiving lots of questions about equitable services, so I just want folks to know that we are working on annotating some of the questions presented in U.S. Ed's um, non-regulatory guidance, and we'll be issuing those um, shortly as soon as they get through communications and our approval process. Um, but we have included some Kentucky specific information, clarification on some of those questions. So um, just be looking um, for that to come out soon. All right, Brenda, you have anything else that you wanted oh, to I share? Just, well, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, Title I consultants are available for technical assistance during the GMAT process and make sure that you are using the 2021 consultant um, link on our webpage because some of the consultants did change. We have some new consultants and make sure that you're following up with your current one for the coming school year. That's a good reminder. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and uh, hopefully we will be able to talk to you again next month. But in the meantime, uh, let us know if you have any questions or anything we can help with. Thank you so much.